If you watch skate videos today, you're basically watching stuntmen. It can take hours to get a trick, and usually one that's planned out in advance. Pro skaters spend a lot of time training, and the biggest stars get expensive surgeries regularly. That, and if you only watch videos, you'd think skateboarding is just a list of tricks. Only a few big names push the edges of what's possible on a board, while most of the industry sticks to known territory or follows trends. It's been like that for a long time, for sure, but all things start small. Skaters hitting pools and ramps has been happening since the late 70s, but the type of skating you usually see in videos is more a cousin of ramp skating than the same thing, and basically evolved on its own. And, at first at least, it wasn't even multiple scenes evolving and pushing each other to be more creative, as you sometimes get in music history. What's known as street skating today evolved out of a specific era in a specific pocket of a specific city. Let's set the stage. San Francisco has always been two things, a center of innovation and a magnet. The gold rush of 1849, the event that founded the city as it is today, drew people from all over the world. The summer of love pulled in busloads of hippies from across the country. The early days of the Castro brought a huge LGBTQ crowd to the city. And as of 2020, SF is still a business capital that sold its soul to tech. Sad to say, but the thousands of white collar workers that come in and raise rents are part of a long standing pattern. On the innovation front, obviously the hippies and the gay crowd pioneered new lifestyles here. And most of the tech we use was born in the region. But sometimes San Francisco's contributions to world culture don't exactly make sense at first glance. Here's one example. We all know the tropes of the noir genre. A big, oppressive city. A tough detective. A complicated plot usually involving beautiful women and the main character getting his ass kicked. All this lends itself to a big town like New York, Chicago, or even LA. But the hard-boiled crime story was shaped by a writer named Dashiell Hammett and he developed and explored this style in an apartment in the Tenderloin, an amazing if gritty neighborhood near downtown San Francisco. Hammond had worked as an actual detective and was writing from experience, much of which he got in Prohibition era SF. But the only feature of the noir genre that shows its San Franciscan roots is the concept of the dark urban alleyway. It's an uncommon feature in most US cities, while SF has a ton of them. And one more common feature of SF history is that important events tend to be isolated in different areas. Chinatown is a gold rush remnant, the Fillmore has its jazz legacy, the Mission has its insane mural culture, and neighborhoods like the Castro, the Haight, Cow Hollow, and Dashiell Hammett's Tenderloin are landmarks for various reasons. San Francisco history seems to focus on one neighborhood at a time in some ways. Well, this video is about a moment that checks off all three of those boxes. Kids came from all over the world to SF in the 90s and 2000s to a place where modern skateboarding was being invented literally trick by trick, and most of it took place in one neighborhood, the area surrounding a stretch of Bayside Road known as the Embarcadero. But we're not done time traveling just yet, because the story of SF skateboarding really begins in the 1950s, with what was then known as the Freeway Revolt. Robert Moses, the semi-elected dictator that basically designed New York City, was big on freeways. He would bulldoze any neighborhood that needed to come down to build his roads. One of his favorite tactics was to build part of a freeway and say, well, we started this, do you really want to leave it unfinished? Moses was horribly racist and a total dick, but he had friends all over the US that would use similar tactics to lay out urban freeway systems, and those tactics almost always worked. That is, until Moses' jackass philosophy reached San Francisco. SF isn't a big town as far as area, and the freeway system that was proposed was going to gut the city and turn it into a ghost of itself, a bunch of isolated neighborhoods surrounded by elevated roads. Well, SF wasn't having it and, along with Monterey to its south, stood up to the Moses wannabes and made them back down. No freeways were built through SF, which was a major victory for urban rights. Okay, what does this have to do with skateboarding? Well, the SF goons did end up building part of one freeway, 480. Because their scheme didn't work though, the road would remain unfinished. It stood there, an out of place feeder to Chinatown until the Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989, when it became so damaged that the cost would be the same to fix it or haul it out as rubble. Once the remains of 480 were gone, the city started to develop the land where it had stood, a stretch of Bayside real estate between the financial district and the ferry building that would come to be known as the Embarcadero. 
Just like the late 70s LA drought cleared out backyard pools and invented pool skating, NorCal's 1989 quake would make space for the construction of a grip of SF's legendary street spots and arguably birth street skating. Legendary spots would be built in the footprint of 480. The plaza spot known as Pier 7 would be completed in 1993, while construction on the spot known as the Bay Blocks would end in 1996. 480 ran just in front of the ferry building, where another plaza spot, sometimes known as the island, sits today. But these spots weren't where street skating in San Francisco began. That would be Justin Herman Plaza, just across the street towards the financial district. This brick surface plaza spot already existed when 480 came down, but skating there really took off in the earthquake's aftermath for whatever reason. The plaza was nicknamed Embarco by the locals, but it became known worldwide as EMB. That was actually the name of the main crew that skated the spot, who called themselves Embarco's most blunted, but even if it's inaccurate, I'm going to use the more common nickname here. Now I could use all kinds of adjectives to talk about EMB, but I'll just say this. It is almost impossible to overstate this spot's influence on the practice of street skateboarding. Although John Lucero was the first to take lip tricks, such as the backside lip slide here, and apply them to street architecture, the foundation of modern urban skateboarding was laid at EMB because here, skaters weren't really imitating things you could do on a ramp. The grinds and slides were done solely on the ledges. The spot could be skated multiple ways. Besides hitting the blocks as ledges, you could use them as manual pads or jump down the stacks where there was enough runway to build momentum. There was even a giant gap that heavy hitters would use as a proving ground later on. Mike Carroll and Henry Sanchez were well known to be the most inventive skaters at EMB, but you had a large crowd of guys like Javante Turner, Chico Brenes, the McBride brothers, Drake Jones, Mike Cow, and too many others to name doing tricks that had literally never been done before. This innovation was both unprecedented for skateboarding and normal for San Francisco, which, like we talked about, has always been home to revolution. Soon enough, though, these skaters were filming their skating and becoming superstars, and with the media coverage of what was happening in EMB came San Francisco's magnetic pull again, this time for kids everywhere that wanted a piece of the SF skate scene. They came from all corners of the U.S., Stevie Williams from Philadelphia, Jamie Thomas from Alabama, and abroad. J.B. Gallet would make it all the way from France, while the skater known as The Butcher would come up from Argentina, among countless other stories. SF was working its magic once again. But the city wasn't just EMB, and it never had been. First off, skaters had been bombing the city's famous hills since the invention of skateboards, and crews like the Sick Boys were doing early street skating all over the city before the EMB scene was born. But while they were at EMB itself, skaters had a number of options as far as alternate spots, Close by was an elevated walkway with high ledges known as Hubba Hideout. Across the Embarcadero itself were parts of the Bay Blocks. Just down California Street was the legendary Brown Marble Plaza. And further into the city, away from the Bay, were spots like Union Square, Black Rock, the Civic Center's Library Plaza, and the China Banks, among many others. And even the most EMB-centric skaters had a lot of time to skate them, as they were playing a cat and mouse game at the main spot. EMB was, if it wasn't obvious, illegal to skate, and workers at the neighboring office buildings would supposedly call the cops every day. When the cops arrived, lookouts would sound the alarm and the skaters would scatter, then come back an hour or two later and continue skating. I also have to mention the fact that the plaza was basically policed by a crew spearheaded by James Kelch, unofficial mayor of EMB, and skaters that were getting in people's way or giving off the wrong vibe would get pushed out of the spot. It was its own ecosystem. And then, in 1995, the nearby workers convinced the SFPD to permanently post a cop at the plaza instead of continuing the game. By this point, people were evolving tricks off the foundation pioneered at EMB all over the US and the world. Los Angeles, Vancouver, and New York had notable scenes, and skateboarders had long ago discovered the legendary Philadelphia spot known as Love Park, a spot not unlike EMB. But even though it was now a skate city among other skate cities, SF was still going strong because one of the new spots, built after 480 came down, had at least partially filled the gap left by EMB. This spot was Pier 7, and it would prove to be another magnet for skaters from all over the world. This plaza wasn't the same as EMB, and that no two spots are going to be the same, unlike two football fields, and it was skated very differently, but it kept the SF scene alive and well as one of the sport's epicenters. 
Here's where I would get into the sad part, but I'm not going to spend more space on it than I have to. The gist is that SF had all its 90 spots destroyed or skate stopped and was relatively abandoned by the skate industry, save Thrasher, the industry's leading magazine, and deluxe distribution. Bottom line, SF is run by people that really don't like skaters, and they did a pretty good job at screwing the scene over, not that it was any one person's call. Let's just say that out of all the spots I mentioned, the China Banks is the only one to exist more or less in the form it has been in since the 90s, and that way more spots than I mentioned have since disappeared or been made unskatable. Newer spots like the island, skate parks like Potrero and the Treasure Island DIY, as well as the supposedly semi-skate park 3rd and Army are keeping the city going, and crews like GX1000 are killing it skating the hills. But it's hard to deny that the city lost a lot with the death of the Embarcadero spots. The center of the skate industry is now firmly Los Angeles, but here's what gets me. San Francisco is much smaller than LA, but it once dominated skate media and coverage. That in itself would be a head-scratcher if you didn't know all the stuff I just talked about, and it really is something to chew on. Skating could have evolved any number of places, could have taken different paths, but it happened in SF, and it happened as it did. Even if the Embarcadero isn't known for its skate history, and not enshrined up there with the hate or whatever, that history is there. It's also got to be said that the skaters at EMB weren't just pioneering ways to interact with the city physically. Skateboarders look at the world differently, I can't walk by a bench and not analyze if it's skatable. And that type of vision, that decoder ring for the city, was first used to decode SF. And just like the alleys of the Nor genre give away its SF origins, skateboarding will always be connected with San Francisco because of one minor detail in how spots are described. Hubba Hideout, the spot with the high ledges going downstairs, ended up being a reference point for similar spots around the world. They're all known as hubbas. But what does Hubba even mean? Well, Hubba Hideout got its name because it was a sort of hidden spot that was great for smoking crack, and people would often be seen doing it. Hubba was 90s Bay Area slang for crack. Yes, large chunks of concrete are named after some obscure 30-year-old NorCal word for a drug. And to be honest, that's kind of a beautiful thing. This has been another map video. If you dug it, give it a like or comment, let me know what you think, and subscribe if you're into that sort of thing. There's also a Patreon link in the description. Peace out.